burden of our there's an elevated burden of RSV. Uh, unfortunately, premature babies are more likely to experience severe RSV. Um, and doubly unfortunately, um, African-American women are 50% higher to have mm -hmm. um, or give birth to a premature baby. Um, and so for, for those that are um, either are clinicians um, and serve um, African-American women um, or African-American families, this is a particularly important talking point um, to be aware of. Um, additionally, uh, Black and Hispanic children are two times to three times more likely to experience severe RSV. Um, and therefore, we're seeing an issue of increased hospitalizations within um, Black and Hispanic families, as well as Native American families when it comes to RSV. Dr. Lavia, um, who's joining us today as a speaker, will talk a bit more about the clinical impact of the new RSV immunization and why it's so important to reduce this burden. Audrey, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Can you hit swap displays at the top of your screen? You're showing us your presenter view. Oh, oh, okay. Sorry. So oh, okay. Thank Does you so much. Help? Does that help? Uh, your, if you just hit slideshow. Is this better now? Better now? Uh, it looks like, okay. So this is still your presenter slides. Okay, I don't think I can help that right now. So okay. I'm about to wrap up. It's okay. Um, we, we really want to call out um, the issue of RSV in terms of families with low income status, just because of how important it is uh, for the recent win that we experience of the new RSV immunization being included in the Vaccines for Children program, which Erin Jones from March of Dines is going to talk a little bit more about in a second. But RSV hospitalizations have impacted uh, children in the lowest income group the most, um, doubly, double than children um, uh, otherwise. And those that rely on Medicaid especially um, have experienced 62% of RSV uh, immunization, uh, hospitalizations. So again, uh, really important as we talk about the importance of the Vaccines for Children program that Medicaid coverage, um, you know, as you all are aware, remains inconsistent um, state to state. And so therefore it was extremely important that uh, we see that in order to ensure equitable access to the new RSV immunization um, that has been recently approved by the FDA um, and then accepted by the Advisory Committee of Immunization and Practice um, into the to be included in the Vaccines for Children program um, to ensure that this new immunization is going to be provided to all family, uh, families that uh, uh, qualify for the Vaccines for Children program at no cost. Um, but this is, there's still, you know, more to do. And um, please visit our, um, our report and read our report. NMQF uh, released a report earlier this month. I can't believe it's still this month. Um, the RSV Health Equity Action Report um, at rsvequityaction.org. Uh, and we'll put the uh, URL in the chat. Please go ahead and download that report because it does talk through what I just discussed it in more detail, um, but then talks about what we can all do together to ensure um, you know, that we continue to reduce the burden of RSV on minoritized populations as we move forward. So it, we talk about strengthening surveillance systems. We talk about educating providers and families, um, really launching, uh, culturally competent public health campaigns and continuing to uh, move research ahead to uh, bring forth new innovation in RSV care. And with that, I will um, stop my presentation and invite, uh, I will invite um, Dr. Lavia to talk a little bit more about this new immunization and the breakthrough that is promising to reduce the RSV burden. I guess it helps if I unmute. Great, thank you so much. Can you see my slides? 
You can? Yes. So um, I'm Bill LaVia. I'm a medical director um, at Santa Fe, and I'm excited to be with you. And, um, you know, I think of this as we're entering a new era in terms of RSV prevention. Um, it's essentially a, a paradigm shift, of you, as you've just heard. Um, so um, just to... Uh, to level set, I know you all are aware of RSV disease and understand the importance, but I really I want to go ahead and highlight just how impactful this disease is. I don't think we need much of a reminder after last season, but by way of reminder, this is a pyramid that really outlines the disease burden for infants less than a year of age, who are the primary population that are affected by RSV. So at the very bottom, we begin with the annual birth cohort that's just under 4 million patients. And we see that two out of three infants, two out of three, two thirds of infants are infected in their first year of life before they turn one year of age. So that ends up being about a little over two and a half million infants are infected. And of those infants who are infected, RSV goes into the lungs, causing a lower respiratory tract infection, primarily bronchiolitis, but also pneumonia in over 850,000 infants each year. When we break that down in the orange section of the pyramid, second from the top, this is from a recent CDC study that looked through their active surveillance network those infants, those 850,000 infants who develop a lung infection, 400,000 of them go to their pediatrician or to a clinic. 150,000 of them end up in the emergency department. And somewhere between 30,000 and 80,000 end up hospitalized. Thus, about 600,000 require medically attended visits for these lung infections. That means that one in seven infants that are born each year end up requiring medical attention for this infection. And when you drill down specifically on those hospitalizations, again, to the points that, some of the points that we just heard mentioned, a disproportionate number of infants from Medicaid are represented in the hospital. The risk for an infant born who has Medicaid insurance coverage is twice that for an infant that does not have Medicaid insurance coverage. Um, at the very top of the pyramid are the deaths. There's about 100 or so deaths each year in infants under 12 months of age from RSV disease. That is because we have excellent, excellent supportive care for these hospitalized infants in the US and other Western countries like the US. When you look at deaths globally in developing countries, RSV is the second leading cause of mortality in those countries. Um, and it remains the leading cause of hospitalization in the US. Now, you heard that the FDA just last month has approved a product we've been working on for uh, a number of years now. And that product is a passive immunization called nercivimab. And it's for the prevention of lung disease due to RSV in babies who are entering their first RSV season and in babies who are, remain vulnerable to severe RSV disease that could lead to hospitalization or complications who are entering their second year of life. Of course, it's contraindicated in infants who have a history of serious reactions, including anaphylaxis to it or any of the excipients in the product. Again, most babies are only gonna get this once. So that's really, that's really not gonna be an issue except for those second season babies. Um, those types of reactions have been seen with other passive immunization antibodies like this one but they weren't seen in any of the clinical studies. And of course, we'll be monitoring for those. Um, they're exceedingly rare in even with those other products. And like any other IM injection, like a vaccine, um, precaution has to be taken in infants who have 
problems with bleeding or coagulation. Um, the most common adverse reactions we saw in the trial were low, um, rash in 0.9% and injection site reactions in 0.3%, that's swelling or redness at the site of the injection. Those reactions are much less than we see with typical active immunizations or vaccines. Um, from the standpoint of how it will be provided um, to infants, it comes prepackaged in two doses for them, depending on which weight band they're in. It's stored in the refrigerator like a typical vaccine. It can be out of the refrigerator for up to eight hours before it's administered. And it can be given with the routine vaccines that kids are getting at multiple points throughout that first year of life. Again, as I mentioned, the FDA recently approved that this antibody immunization for neonates and infants. There's two doses, depending on which weight band, whether you're over five, five kilos and over, or whether you're under five kilos. And it's a single um, dose for infants in that second year of life. So it's very simple to implement, much like a flu vaccine that kids are over six months are recommended to receive each year. Not only was this recently FDA approved, but earlier this month, the, advisory, the CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices recommended this immunization for inclusion on the vaccine schedule. And most importantly, um, uh, for equitable coverage, they recommended it for inclusion in the Vaccines for Children program, which is a, a, an entitlement program that provides immunizations um, to children and has really changed um, the, the whole, the entire landscape since it's, um, since it's, since it came into existence approximately 20 years ago, or almost exactly 20 years ago, right? Um, their recommendations are, they look slightly different than the FDA indication, but in reality, they're essentially the same. And the way this is meant to be given, you know, I alluded to, you know, we think of um, flu vaccines being given each year at this, you know, before the start of the influenza season. For infants who are born before the season, those are babies born April to September, uh, April to October, nercivimab would be given either in October or November to protect babies throughout the season. And it's just one dose to protect babies throughout the season. For those babies born during the season or in October just before the season that you see across the bottom there, they would be given the nirsevimab shortly after birth. And that's one of the things I wanna highlight for this group is, you know, shortly after birth could mean in the newborn nursery or in the regularly scheduled well child care that is intended to occur three to five days after discharge. Just this week, we published a study um, looking at data of, about those follow-up visits and hospital discharges. And I think this is really striking for the commercially insured infants uh, on the left, one in seven commercially insured infants did not make it to that visit within five days of birth. For Medicaid infants, one in four, so a quarter of infants didn't make it to that first outpatient visit within five days of birth. And if you think about it, when RSV is circulating, again, remember, it's the leading cause of hospitalization for babies, despite the fact that it only circulates those five months I just showed you on the previous slide. So a baby that's discharged in the middle of RSV season could get exposed even though during those first five days before they can get immunized. And some of them, up to a quarter in the Medicaid population, are going to miss that follow-up visit. Um, so we think the ideal time to catch these infants is in the hospital where we can make sure that they're protected the minute they go out the door. Something to think about. And I'll end with, you know, what kind of an impact this might have, this is assuming 100% uptake, which we all know is a pipe dream, but we want we, we shoot for the moon even if we hit the woodshed, right? Um, so you, 
look, using a 75% reduction in disease based on the clinical studies that led to the licensure, we would prevent 300,000 office visits, 112,000 emergency department visits, and 25 to 60,000 hospitalizations um, if we had 100% implementation. So, I mean, that should be our goal. Um, we'll never get to 100%, but the closer we get, the better. Um, I'll stop there and, uh, and uh, thank you for your attention and appreciate uh, your interest and happy to discuss any questions you might have. Okay, and uh, we'll, we'll, we will reserve questions for after our conversation, but please keep them in mind, put them in the Q&A um, chat uh, tool if you can. Okay, uh, Dr. Erin, uh, would you like to start? You're also on mute. There we go, sorry about that. That would be helpful, right? Hi, everybody. My name is Erin Jones. I work with the Marsha Dimes as legislative counsel, and I'm really excited to be here. And I'm going to try really hard to stay under 10 minutes because I could talk about this for a very long time. So I'm pretty passionate about immunizations and vaccines and really excited to partner with my esteemed colleagues here on the panel, but also with the National Minority Quality Forum, because I think that one of the things that we've really got to make sure is that our families understand what this is and how it benefits them and that it's safe. So I think that's kind of my theme of what I'm gonna talk about today. So what I wanted to tell people is if you're not familiar with the March of Dimes, we have been working on immunization since our inception. So for those of you who might not know, we started in 1938. And at the time, our president of the United States, Franklin D. Roosevelt himself had polio. And so that is the reason why we started. He started our organization because he wanted to find a cure for what was crippling the United States, truly and, and honestly crippling the United States at the time. And then if you look through the span of time, we've never given up on vaccines. We've continued to persevere and keep vaccines you know, in our sight and in our scope. Um, and today we're really looking at, let's see if I can get this to a slide. It's not advancing, sorry. Hmm. Sorry about that. doesn't want to move. There we go. So that's today. So we haven't changed much. We're still continuing to look at moms and babies. We want to make sure moms are healthy before they have pregnancy, um, after their pregnancy, during their pregnancy. And then we also are looking at preterm birth, which we had someone had mentioned earlier, um, and looking at infant death. And at the same time, while we're doing this, really making an emphasis on ending the health equity gap. So we want to see healthy moms and strong babies. And so that's what our whole purpose is and vaccines have a big place of that. So I'm not gonna go with too much of the wins because I think Dr. Lavia did a great job of talking about what's happened with RSV recently. Um, from the March and Imes perspective and for the families that we work with, RSV is crippling for our um, newborn babies that are considered preterm birth or even late, chain, late or preterm birth um, because it affects the lungs. And in pre prematurity, that's usually the number one thing that babies need to have growing um, that haven't fully developed yet. And so this has been, this is really critical um, for families that have babies that maybe were born preterm birth and in the next year of life, they might be able to get, you know, this antibody that will prevent them from having anything in the future or catching RSV in the future. So this is a big game changer for us, for the families that we work with. So we're really excited about this. We're also excited that the, um, advisory committee, as somebody had already mentioned, suggested that this be recommended and be part of the vaccine for children's program, which I'm gonna talk about soon. Um, so this is for us, this is an opportunity for families to get ahead of something, right? To prevent something from happening. I think Dr. Lavia showed us the incidents and how much it costs the United States when these poor babies or children um, are hospitalized. So if we can prevent children from having to be in the hospital, then we're doing a good thing but it's really important that we get the message out to everybody. So I wanna talk a little bit about the message um, because we're coming off of a pandemic, right? We're, we're living with COVID. It's gonna be part of our conversations now, pretty much going forward in our lives. There's a lot of residual that has happened in the vaccine world and the immunization world with our parents and with our, and, and really people across the country. 
Um, there's a lot of mistrust still in the industry, uh, probably even more so than before. Uh, we have a lot of um, residuals from how our government handled the pandemic, whether you agree with it or not. Um, Operation Warp Speed had some good things, but also had some bad things. And so we're still dealing with some of that fragmented care that happened during COVID. Uh, people are very concerned about safety. They wanna make sure that, it, if, am I doing the right thing for my children? Am I doing the right thing for myself? Is this safe for me to take? Um, our media friends, sometimes they're our partners and sometimes they're not. Social media has not been the best to us around vaccines and immunizations. There's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of conspiracy theories out there about government and how we're, we're tracking people through vaccines, um, all not true. But the way that they're posed on the media and in social media, they look very real. They look like they're very credible. Um, they look like they're scientific and evidence-based, not always the case. So it's really important for us to recognize what, what's, what a family is going through when they're trying to make a decision about getting a vaccine or an immunization. We're gonna talk about access um, and some folks already talked about it today, but it's really critically important that we have equitable access. And this, when I'm talking about disparities, that's not just race and ethnicity, but geographic. And I know we always, we talk about our rural families not maybe having access, but our urban families also don't have access. Our suburban families sometimes don't have access. And access means different things for different people and we have to meet families where they are. So that's really important. And lastly is our healthcare providers. People just assume that every doctor buys in into everything and knows that this is the right thing to do. There's a lot coming at our healthcare providers at the same time as well. And so we have to make sure we're providing them the education they need so that they in turn can answer intelligently questions, hard questions that they're gonna get from families who are reluctant or don't wanna be vaccinated and wanna know more information. So I put that all out there to say, you know, RSV and what's happening is a win for us, but we've got work to do. So to, in order for us to get it to, to families, to get people to feel like they can comfortably have the conversation with their provider, we got some work to do. So I'm excited that we're having this kind of conversation. I'm excited the folks that have joined because that's how we're going to do this. This is a playbook back from the polio days. The only way we're going to do this and get everybody on the same page is by having conversations and those tough conversations, right? Not everybody is gonna agree. And people wanna see the science and the evidence. And so we've got to be prepared to be able to do that. So how do we do, how do we get families RSV or any immunization really? So we're actually coming on the anniversary, 30 years of the vaccine for children program being in existence. This is a program that's government funded. It's done through the CDC um, in partnership with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid. Um, the funds come into the states and then the funds are distributed to physicians who choose to join the program. And I'll talk a little bit about that in the next slide. Um, but I think the benefits that we need to see is this is an opportunity for kids who ordinarily might not have access um, to vaccines or even to a provider at this time where they would typically get their vaccine, vaccinations or immunizations. And so they threw, this, this slide is directly from the CDC. I didn't make it, I completely stole it from them this morning. So I'm giving them their credit, um, but it shows you what they've been able to prevent over the last 30 years. And I think those numbers are pretty good. I mean, the big one for me is the societal cost. If you look at $2.2 trillion in society cost, um, and that is shared by all of us, every single one of us. We'll talk a little bit more about the vaccine program and how it works. So as I mentioned, the vaccine for children program basically works this way. Um, the CDC has the funds, they give it to the states. The states then uh, have an opportunity for uh, providers to join and providers make the decision if they want to be a part of the program. Um, there are some things that they have to do. They have to handle the uh, storage and the handling of the vaccine. And I think uh, Dr. Lavia talked a little bit about how this is stored, which is very typical with some of the other vaccines that are available. Um, and they, you know, they go through trainings. There's some quality improvement that has to continue. Um, you know, and, and feedback with the CDC on what they're seeing or, or what they're hearing from families or how it's being administered so that there's this constant conversation that's happening between providers and from the CDC. Um, and there is no fee. I think people need, uh, need to understand that, that um, the providers do not bill parents um, for any of the vaccines. Uh, basically to get into the, like, 
once a family has determined that they want to get immunizations um, and maybe they want to use the, they might not even know that the vaccine for families or vaccine for children program exists. Um, and oftentimes they're being utilized and they might not even know it. It could be behind the scenes. So it could be that a provider is linked into the program and utilizes it for patients that are Medicaid eligible or on Medicaid. Um, they also might not be insured. They could be underinsured. And what I mean by that is they might have employer-based insurance, but it doesn't cover certain vaccines. Um, and so this would be an opportunity for them to utilize this program. Um, also, if you are Native American or if they are Alaskan Natives, they automatically are eligible for the program. And all of this is at no cost. So there's no cost, no cost sharing to the family whatsoever. A lot of the times we will have uh, families that call the March of Dimes and wanna know, I need to get my child immunized. How do I do it? Where do I go? This is certainly one program. We always suggest that families have a PCP and have a place of care, but sometimes they don't. And if they don't, um, they can go to the Department of Public Health. They can go to their local pharmacies, their schools. The school nurse oftentimes has a list of the doctors that are available in this program and where they can go. Our federally qualified health centers are a place where people can go to get uh, information, but also probably get immunized. Um, so there are lots of ways for people to get involved in the program that they may not even know the name of the program themselves. But it's really critically important that if we're talking to families or if we're talking to our friends and families or um, at an event and someone says, you know, I, I don't have the coverage, but I really want to have this discussion or have my children immunized, that we know in the back of our head, hey, this program exists. And how do we get a family hooked up to that? So I think that uh, the fact that it's been in existence for 30 years gives us a, a good solid understanding of how the program should work um, and getting feedback from parents who have participated in the program. So we're pretty excited that RSV will be included uh, and we hope that uh, more, more families and more providers are able to participate in the program. Um, and then lastly, what I would just wanted to mention is that um, thinking about immunizations and thinking about, as I mentioned earlier, coming where we are in the United States and coming off of a pandemic and um, how people are feeling in the country in general, um, we've got some work to do. We've got, we've got a gap to fill. We've, we've got some families who by no fault of their own, they just were busy working, pandemic shut down things, and they just could have, haven't had a chance to get back to what we would call, I guess, if you wanna call normal life. So we're really working hard with partners like who are on this call today uh, to make sure that we are talking to folks about getting back to their immunization schedule. And that's not just kids, that's also adults. Uh, we're coming up on the flu season, as we just talked about. I mean, there's opportunities there uh, for parents to protect themselves as well. So we're working really hard to make sure we all are getting back on track with our immunizations. Uh, this is National Immunization Awareness Month. So we're partnering with folks across the country to get that message out. Um, I think that the National Minority Quality Forum does a fantastic job, and I know he is going to talk a little bit about that as well, is really getting down to that grassroots, getting down to the local community voice and having those, those providers um, have the leaders, the faith-based groups, the folks that really are talking to other families that might actually have questions um, that nobody else ever hears. And so it's critically important for us to provide them with access to good, solid information so that they can answer those questions and have those honest conversations. March of Dimes also has a toolkit available on their website if people are interested in having those resources available to them. We also have a mom and baby bus, which goes out into um, disparate communities, but also rural and urban uh, to do immunizations if it's needed and if a family needs it. So um, we're continuing to partner with our government officials, as well as our community partners, our schools, public health stakeholders, just trying to get the message out as much as we can, and mostly working with consumers, moms and dads who have, are very passionate about this issue themselves and want their kids to go to school with other kids that are healthy um, and have the potential to talk to parents who maybe are a little hesitant. They're not necessarily anti-vax, they're just hesitant. They wanna know more. They wanna understand what's really happening with this uh, antibody. What does that even mean? How is it different than a typical vaccine? Those are the things that families are asking. And that's what we are trying our best to provide in, in plain English so everyone can understand it. And then lastly, the, since I do policy work and I work at the national level, one of the big things we're doing is working on uh, making sure that people, there are policies and monies available so that people have access, that programs have access um, and eliminating loopholes. So looking at our exemption policies in the United States um, and closing loopholes where they don't belong. So I like, 
Dr. Lavia will be available for questions, and I hope that we have some interactive opportunities to answer questions, but also hear from you guys what's happening. So I will stop my share. Yes, and uh, uh, we do have one question in there, and Mosey will get to it in one second. Um, well, not one second. We'll, we have a couple questions uh, to talk about first, and then we'll get to your question, if you don't mind. Um, okay, well, first, a question to Dr. Mm -hmm. Livia. Um, some experts are saying that um, there might not be as much of an uptake of this new RSV immunization as we would like to see, given the need, um, perhaps because it's a new therapy, perhaps because of, as um, Aaron has just mentioned, continued concerns of um, vaccine hesitancy. Uh, what do you think the role, uh, what role clinicians and providers can play in encouraging uptake? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think um, clinicians and healthcare providers are the most important people in this equation, right? Numerous studies have shown that, you know, there, there, there is all this noise, whether it's on social media, on the web, where, you know, wherever these you know, wherever folks are choosing to get information from. But if a clinician sits down and discusses the pros and cons of an immunization, that is what resonates the most with them. It doesn't always convince them to move forward, but it but it but they take it very seriously. Um, you know, it's unfortunate that that, you know, People have some what we might consider unreasonable concerns about vaccinating or immunizing their child. Um, and, you know, one of the things, you know, that we thought about, you know, is in teaching people about how nercivimab could protect their infant preterm, term, um, or with, you know, underlying conditions from RSV is this is not a traditional vaccination and traditional vaccinations tend to have more side effects. It's because they're inducing inflammation to produce the immunity that you need to fight those infections. One of the things with a passive immunization where you're just giving the antibody to give them immediate protection or close to immediate protection from that infection is that the reactions are less. And so maybe as we help providers think about how to talk about this, maybe it's better that they talk about it as a preventive antibody rather than an immunization. Because words can matter, and technically it's both, right? It's a passive immunization, but it's a protective or preventive antibody. And so I think you know, to drill down on that, I think it's, you know, it's on an individual by individual basis, listening to them, providing information in a way that it resonates with them and realizing that those providers are the most important source of information for families. That's great. And again, encouraging folks to use the Q&A function to submit your questions as well as maybe the chat box as well. Um, what kind of providers, you know, clinicians could be part of this conversation? Who, who else needs to be part of this conversation? I think some folks would assume pediatricians, um, you, you talked about the need uh, for a ton of conversation and perhaps counseling. Um, what other, you know, interventions could happen um, to ensure that patients are fully um, aware and understand the um, preventative care that's available? Yeah, of course, pediatricians. Um, I, I don't know. Did you mean me, by the way? <laughs> Yes, I met you. Okay, of course, <laughs> pediatricians, but you know, also other other providers, family practitioners, um, uh, public health physicians. Um, but it doesn't stop there. It's also you know, it could be you know, extenders, physician assistants, nurse practitioners in those offices. But I think it extends all the way down through the nurses in the office, through the medical assistants in the office. Oftentimes those people have the most time with the families. And if the, if the providers aren't aligned from top to bottom, you know, if your pediatrician tells you, yeah, 
you should get this. But then the medical assistant said, oh, I wouldn't get that for my baby. What's going to happen? What's going to happen if they see, you know, that discord, uh, you know, amongst the providers? So everybody should understand the benefits, the pros and cons, and should be aligned on, you know, how they approach these families. I think it's critical that all layers of the health of healthcare providers um, be, you know, aligned and positive about protecting babies. Yeah, and, and, and you know, from a policy perspective at MQF, we are looking at, you know, is, is there enough um, support or reimbursement for um, providers to take that extra time, especially, I mean, for um, patients that, ex that are more exposed to disinformation, misinformation, um, particularly when there's a new therapy, you know, we are really um, in support of making sure that that time is taken, um, that that sensitivity is considered, um, that, you know, there's time allowed for that appropriate bedside manner to um, ensure and improve, you know, vaccine um, immunization confidence. So, um, it, you know, one thing that could also be considered, right, uh, Dr. Olivia and Aaron is perhaps uh, just more education in general, um, you know, with with folks that are, are maybe perhaps health advocates, would you say? Absolutely. And we've, you know, one of the things we've been working on, so leading up to um, the licensure of nercivimab, we've been working for the last couple of years to educate people about RSV because it's one, it's a, it's, you know, it's surprising for the illness that is the leading cause of hospitalization in babies lay people haven't really known it by name, if you will. Every pedi pediatrician or pediatric provider knows it by name because it overwhelms them every winter. But lay people haven't known it by name. So we've raised awareness around that. And now moving forward, we have a campaign to raise awareness you know, on social media, um, through advertisements, et cetera, direct to the public once approved you know, by the FDA for those purposes to raise awareness around now there's an intervention to target the most likely reason your baby will be hospitalized in their first year of life. I don't know, Aaron, if you have, you know, specific comments around that. I think what you said is, you know, uh, straight on the point. Um, the only other thing I would suggest is some of those um, partners, the, the ones that we don't always talk to. So our doulas, our community health workers, the ones that are talking to moms every day about everyday things like, did you know there's a coupon for this in the grocery store? And oh, by the way, RSV season's coming. You know, like they're having, you know, uh, everyday conversations with families. And I think that that's critically important. When you go to the doctors, you're expected to have a healthcare conversation, but sometimes it comes up when you weren't talking about those things. So those partners and those community groups um, that you have everyday conversations with, it's important that we get the right information out to them too, uh, yeah. so that they feel confident about it for their own children. Right. And, and we'll have our Akia Blue in a second talk through how you can have those conversations about this new um, preventive care. But um, over to you, Erin. You know, after inclusion in the Vaccines for Children program, what other policy changes do you see are might be needed to ensure equitable access and awareness of this new um, therapy? I think you started to say it already. It's making sure that there's enough funds, right, to do the education. So. We all, most of us who work in policy know education tends to be the first thing that's cut from programs mm -hmm. um, or from a hospital budget or from anybody's budget, right? Professional ed or, you know, all of those things. But it's critically important that it stay and maintain and may, maybe even be beefed up considering everything we learned about COVID, right? Everything that we learned during that pandemic, let's not forget it just because they declared it to be over. We truly do need to put more money into policies or into areas that people can draw down from to do the education. Um, and that might be, I know no one likes flyers anymore, but sometimes a flyer works. A visual, not everybody's a digital person. Not everybody is a just auditory. They need a, something in their hand to walk away with. So we've done away with a lot of that over the time. Um, and I think that it can be complemented with other things, but that takes money, right? Gotta have a graphic designer, somebody to print it, somebody to deliver it. It, it costs money to do those kinds of things. So I would say that's definitely an area that we need to look at, but also the access piece, um, equitable access, meaning in neighborhoods across the country need to have access. 
Um, and I don't mean they take three buses to get to CVS to be able to get it. I mean, they truly need to be able to find it in their community with people who look like them, talk like them, and will be able to communicate with them on a, all kinds of levels. So we're really, we are very conscientious of that on the mom baby bus to make sure when we're going into neighborhoods, we look like the neighborhoods we're going into to have honest conversations. Is there more that could be done um, with um, the inclusion in the VFC program, the Vaccines for Children program in particular, to ensure that that is a success? They always could use more money. I'm never going to say they can't. <laughs> I, I know I'm harping on it, but it's the root of all evil. <laughs> um, but I think the program has the success. Like they have proven that they can do this, that we can get it out there. I mean, every program has room for improvement. I think if you talk to the provider side, I think storage sometimes is a difficult thing for some providers. I mean, eight hours on room air sounds great, but if you're only seeing six patients that are eligible for the program or eligible for that vaccine in the day, that might not be the best use of your, you know, of the money. So things like that, I think we need to continue to, but the only way we're gonna do that is by having conversations with providers who are utilizing this program and truly listening. And I think, um, you know, as a partner with CDC, we're doing, we're, we're trying to convene that. Listen to what our, doc, what our docs are saying, um, but also the nurses and the provider and the other folks that are also giving up conversations. CVS has a little more space. A, a private doctor's office doesn't. I know I'm picking on one pharmacy and I apologize. Shouldn't do that. <laughs> no, that's great. Um, and, I, and I should mention that the American Academy of Pediatrics um, also endorsed um, the recommendation by um, ACIP, the Advisory Committee on Immunization and Practices, um, to recommend um, this new uh, immunization and also had some additional ideas. Um, so you can check out their comment letter in regards to how to improve uptake. Um, and to support pediatricians in that regard. Uh, so we do have a question here from um, and the audience. And this is open to either one of you panelists. Um, but the first question was, do we have information on hospitalization and death from infants without insurance coverage? I don't have it off the top of my head, but I'm sure we do. Are you yeah. in, I guess I need a little more specific. Do you mean children overall? Do you mean children that are of age that would be eligible for RSV? I, I would just need a little more. I'm sure we can get it. I, I do think that they probably mean in, infants that um, are eligible or are within the age range for this immunization. I, I will say that uh, in our in our health equity report, uh, health equity action report, we do talk a bit about that, about um, those that are uninsured, those that are underinsured, and those that are publicly insured, and the difference in hospitalization that we've seen. So again, I do think that my partner um, did post the, uh, my colleague did post the link to the report. I, okay, when we'll repost it right now, so you can check it out. Um, but as you can imagine, you know, the um, hospitalization and, and death rate is higher uh, for those um, without insurance. Also, those who are uninsured and then sadly, those who are publicly insured. So what we're saying is, is that um, generally, uh, and, there, and there's multiple factors involved, right, including, um, you know, social determinants involved with low income status. Right. Um, also, um, if you're in environments where there's just more likelihood of res chronic respiratory disease, um, you know, as well as just um, a history of like if you have a history of asthma, which is also more prevalent amongst low income families. Um, so there's a lot that goes into that perfect storm. But thank you for that question. Um, we do have another question here for the panelists. Uh, do you know if MAs can administer um, the new immunization if this is something that should be only, or if this is something that should only be administered by nurses? 
Yeah, that's a great question. I think that varies on a state by state basis. I, off the top of my head, I don't have um, an up to date list of which states they can administer and which they can't. But that is something that uh, you know you can look into in your individual state. Um, and if you happen to be in a state that that doesn't allow that, um, it's it's certainly something you know worth raising your voice about because they they. Uh, can administer vaccines. Um, and since this is going to be implemented in a manner like vaccines to protect with a public health benefit like a vaccine, it's certainly something that should be considered for exemption for those states. So, and I think, you know, what we've heard is that AAP is going to be working uh, on that issue alongside you. So, um, but every voice counts in something like that. I don't know if Aaron has something, you know, information specific to that or not. Nope, I was going to say the same thing. Varies by state. Okay. Any other questions from folks? Um, again, you can post a question in the chat or in the Q and A. Where otherwise we'll go right to our um, presentation by my colleague Akia Blue on how clinicians, advocates can be talking about this new preventative care for RSV to communities, particularly communities of color and, um, and minoritized communities, um, of which then we could have a few minutes for questions after that. Uh, so right now, put your questions in the Q&A. But Akia, over to you. Thank you so much, Adwa. Um, And can you see my screen OK? OK. Thank you. All right, so um, as we know, COVID has of course changed the way that we communicate about vaccines and immunizations. Um, at this point, the word vaccine is a trigger for people either because of burnout or distrust um, from the, how everything happened with COVID. And although we know this new option for RSV is an immunization, we also know that people use immunization and vaccine interchangeably. Um, even if you Google immunization, uh, it'll come up. I think for me, the first option is CDC immunization schedule, but then when you get on their page, they do use vaccine. Um, and most people don't know that there could be a difference between the two. Um, so we do have to consider that when we're messaging it. And we also have to consider how parents feel about the, just giving shots to infants in general, um, especially if it is an optional shot. Um, the idea of putting causing any additional pain to a baby can be particularly distressing for uh, new parents. So we are going to share just some overall language considerations um, that we can use when educating about the RSV immunization. Um, and so what we are seeing is this need to start at a very high level, um, again, because we don't want to trigger parents with words like vaccines, immunization, shot, um, without having pro uh, proper buy-in and explanation and education in place first. So what we would recommend is starting general, um, something along the lines of, I would like to talk to you about a preventative measure that we have that can protect your baby from RSV. Um, and then you can educate about what RSV is, because uh, like uh, Dr. Livia said, Parents might not know it by name, they just know it's something that exists. So making sure that they understand the risk, if their baby is at additional risk, et cetera. And then we wanna make a re strong recommendation for protection, saying something like, this is a single dose RSV protection that will protect your baby from severe RSV. Once you do that and you've answered all your questions about what RSV is, why this is important, then you can move into letting them know what this method of delivery is. So letting the parents know that this is a shot. Um, so you know, to protect your baby from RSV, we would need to give them a shot. It's one shot that can help protect them for the entire season. Again, emphasizing that it is just that one shot, it's one time discomfort, but then they will hopefully be protected from RSV. And at this point, you need to remember to empathize with the parent. Again, they might really be feeling distressed about a shot, um, not understanding what is going into their baby, et cetera. Um, so remind them of the importance of it. And again, answer any further questions that they have about RSV, of course. And then you can explain how it works. Um, and keep in mind that most of these parents probably aren't gonna know what a monoclonal antibody is. They might not even know what an antibody is. Um, so those words can be confusing. So you wanna take the opportunity to explain what an antibody is and that we naturally uh, have those in our bodies normally and that this immunization is helping to provide those antibodies so that babies don't have to be exposed first. Um, they can 
get the antibody and be prepared and protected in case they are exposed to RSV. And with all stages of this, it's really important to be concise and direct. Um, when we're talking to people who have uh, lower health literacy levels, lower education levels, it's best if we can use short sentences, give pauses to allow for parents uh, to take in what you're saying, um, give them the opportunity to repeat words back to you, repeat phrases back to you to make sure that they're understanding what you're saying, um, and just really use simple language, as simple as possible. Keep in mind that words that are common to us, who are a little bit more in this world, uh, might not be common to them. And of course, throughout all of this, remember your patience and ep empathy. And at the end of this discussion, parents are smart, and so they might come to you and say, well, isn't this just a vaccine? And so, of course, you have to be honest with them about the fact that it's an immunization. Take the time to educate them on the difference between the immunization and the vaccine and remind them that with all vaccines, all medicine, anything that we take, whether it's over the counter, whether it's prescription, is routinely uh, gone through the same process. Vaccines and immunizations are routine for babies, and they um, are all well studied, um, as, just as this one is for them. And so just a reminder, and I've said this a few times, and um, it's really something that I believe in, is patience and empathy with these parents. This is a major learning curve. We're talking about the first time that this type of immunization has come to market. Parents aren't going to be familiar with monoclonal antibodies. They might not be familiar with RSV. So you're going to have to be patient explaining these things to them and consider that it may take more than one conversation. And I would just encourage you to stick with the conversation, have it over time. Um, Remember to be empathetic. No one wants to see their baby in pain, even if it's just a quick pinch. No one wants to put something in their, their baby that they don't understand. So just take that time, be sensitive to what they're feeling, but then remind them that you know a little bit of discomfort for the baby now will help prevent much worse pain um, and discomfort for them in the future. And then getting personal, um, I believe Dr. Lavia mentioned this before, but there are other people who might be able to deliver this message and in some cases might be better suited. Um, you know, as healthcare providers, as doctors, you might feel like you're the best person, the only person who can deliver the message. But the truth is, there might be other people in your office, in the hospital, there might be social workers, community members who can really help share this message. And one of the best ways to share it is by sharing personal stories. Um, so if you as the clinician have a personal story to share, or if someone else in your office does, if you have new moms or new dads that are working in your office, see how they can help deliver this messaging to your patients as well, to your parents as well. And finally, throughout all of this, a gentle approach. We've all been through a lot since 2020, but for people from minoritized communities, there is a constant bombardment of messages about how we're more at risk for different diseases and conditions. And it can be very overwhelming and can cause disengagement and cause us to be tired. Um, a lot of people of color might not wanna talk about health, their health right now, just because they're being overwhelmed with all these messaging. So just remember to be gentle, be direct, um, and remember to have that patience and, and empathy throughout. So those are just some quick tips. I know we're coming to the end, but of course, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ikea. Um, it was really great. I just wanna thank um, Aaron Jones from March of Dimes, uh, Dr. Lavia from Santa Fe joining us today. And just very, very quickly, uh, I'm going to show you this website, our rsvequityaction.org, because there are things you can do. Um, there are advocacy actions you can take, whether it's writing letters um, to policymakers, says thanking them for this uh, new um, protection, or just you know keeping up to date with what we're, what we're, um, how we're going to continue this fight ahead. Bookmark this webpage. Um, this also has access to a lot of resources, including um, letters, our public comment letters, fact sheets, um, as well as the social media, um, you know, toolkits and graphics that you can use to help educate folks about RSV. Um, and then that is it. Uh, we want to thank you for your time. This uh, webinar is going to be uploaded to our YouTube channel, which the link is in our in the chat box as well. And thank you again for our panelists as well.